Yes, I'm going to start this recording and uh, welcome everybody. This is another virtual meetup. Uh, we have Ben Lake of today with us. Ben is a dear friend of mine. He's a learner, investor, traveler. Before the pandemic, he traveled pretty much across the world. One of the most traveled digital nomads that I know of. And yeah, he is an expert when it comes to uh, digital currencies, cryptocurrencies, and he is the co-founder of a company called Charge Particles, which is producing their own ERC-20 tokens, tokens that are built on top of the Ethereum platform, something that we will go a bit more in depth on this podcast, I assume. And he's also the co-host of the Crypto Mondays meetup group in LA. And he has a killer podcast called the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. I've listened to every episode of it. He's tempting me a lot on spending me my, spending my hard-earned money into like wild circles, investing in these crazy business ideas and all that stuff. So yeah, with that on, I'll transfer this over to Ben. Welcome, Ben. Awesome, Marco. You you get the biggest high five and virtual hug of uh, the best intro ever. So thanks for that. So Ben, I guess uh, since the people that we have attending today are mostly technical, they do understand computer programming, computer sciences. Why don't we jump off and start things off? Like how can people that are software developers get a bit more involved with cryptocurrencies from their point of view? Sure. Um, well, firstly, Marco, uh, thanks for having me on. Everyone, thanks for jumping on uh, here and listening. Um, I think somebody, yeah, okay, you're on it. Um, so in terms of getting involved, um, I like to think, I getting a little more meta perhaps, but like thinking, I kind of start everything with asking why. So why are you interested in getting involved? Um, because especially right now in a bull market, there's no shortage of people talking about like crypto as the new this or that, or it's pretty hyped and NFTs revolutionizing this or that. So there's a lot of uh, noise in the space. So kind of making sure that you have a clear why of why you're kind of going down this path. And if it's just in the sake of learning, that's fine. Um, but the best way, I mean, right now uh, is doing a, a bit of self-learning. Um, there used to be something, and I should have looked these things up before I jumped on the call, but there used to be something called Crypto Zombies, which was like a gamified way to learn Solidity, which is a Ethereum smart contract uh, language. I'm not sure if it still exists. I still think that it does uh, for learning Solidity. But I mean, the reality is, is that um, devs, developers, uh, software engineers are in high demand in the crypto market right now because it is a bull market. So people have money, people are building. It's this like euphoric state where everybody believes everything is possible and like everybody's willing to collaborate with everybody and throw a little bit money at this to try this thing out. So if, if by chance you're thinking about looking into the crypto market, yes, find out your why, why you're interested, but um, it's a pretty darn good time to get in. So I guess tactical advice would be check out Crypto Zombies. I probably should have Googled it before I pitched that as the number one. Um, and then the next one would be kind of uh, learn as much as you can about crypto in general, what's happening. I'm pretty biased, but I think uh, the Web3 uh, Ethereum world is quite interesting. So another thing that I would recommend is Gitcoin Kernel. They have this virtual Web3 accelerator uh, for building and learning about Web3. Uh, they have a cohort coming up, but learn as much as you can. Jump on Twitter, jump into these projects, discords, and start raising your hand and, and offering to be helpful. Those would be kind of the broad advice to how to get started. That's great advice, Ben. I, I really appreciate you mentioning Solidity. It's the initial language. It's a framework that developers should be using a lot more, in my personal opinion, because it's the only gateway to, towards 
the appropriate learning of cryptocurrencies and how they operate, how they function, and a true understanding of blockchain. So why don't we continue off with a bit more like what makes Ethereum so interesting to you in particular as an investor, as a developer, as pretty much somebody who is really excited about uh, cryptocurrencies and really bullish on Bitcoin? Not bullish on Bitcoin. Get out of here. Uh, no. Yeah. So I guess backing up in this, in this room, like what is kind of the median understanding of crypto? Most people have, are aware of it, have started looking into it, maybe bought a little bit of it, maybe developed a little bit on it. Um, I'm not sure. Generally, I think they, most of the people might have bought something. Gotcha. Okay. So, I mean, I'll, I'll skip the like, what is blockchain and why it's important discussion. If you want a good recommendation there, um, an old episode um, by Tim Ferriss uh, with Nick Zabo from like June 2017 is still the one that I recommend. And they go into much a, a lot of detail of like bigger picture, what is blockchain and why it's important. That's one of the best ones I've, I've still found. Um, so assuming you understand like the premise of blockchain, you understand that Bitcoin offers this new uh, self-sovereign money that is secured by the blockchain. So it's like, it's this awesome thing, this digital store of value. The first time that this digital item is provably scarce and has algorithmic determined supply, all these amazing things. If you if you want to go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, read uh, the Bitcoin standard, which is a really great book, um, or just watch any of Andreas Antonopoulos's uh, videos on YouTube because he's also fantastic. So there's a lot of noise out there, but like sticking to these kind of things that I'm recommending will kind of uh, be your ballast in the storm a bit, or hopefully. Um, so the reason why something like Ethereum is so interesting is because it's the world computer. It's this, uh, this, this smart contract platform, which a smart contract is just an if then statement, but this opens up the door for a ton of different things. So like the creativity that you can do using something like Ethereum or another smart contract platform is, uh, is pretty wild. So if, if you're interested in just like checking out the power of smart contract platforms like Ethereum or DeFi, um, I'd recommend you go or, or, or just Google or watch a YouTube video on how MakerDAO works. Um, so the idea that I take $100 and I lock it into a smart contract and then because that is locked into a smart contract, I'm able to access credit or pull out a loan based on that, using that as collateral for like 50 bucks. It's all done algorithmically via smart contracts. So if the price of that $100 goes down to $65 or whatever, it takes that $100 that was locked in that smart contract and I keep the $50 loan and it was just, you know, I got liquidated. But these things that used to be done via an entire floor of a bank can now be done with a uh, you know, some lines of code via these smart contracts, which is, is really, really fascinating. And there's, there's a lot happening on it. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really, really fascinating space. Yeah, it really is. So isn't this something that you guys do at charge particles, like the smart contracts that you're doing, and right? they are classifying as a launching an ERC 20 token is something classified as a it's a smart contract, right? Yeah, it uh, can be. So, I mean, what we do at Charge Particles is like um, NFTs are very hot right now, right? So um, we've actually been working on this for over a year, but uh, it's long, long before they were as hot as they are right now. But uh, what we do via a mess of smart contracts, basically, is we uh, allow you to take your NFT, your non-fungible token. And I feel like I've just thrown out a million different acronyms and like garbledy goop about crypto. So please just message in the chat if like I've gone way above your uh, heads on these things and I can back down. 
because uh, I feel like I just, I asked where everybody was like uh, knowledge wise. And then I just assumed you were here and I dove straight in. So uh, if I've lost you, just, just message me and I'm happy to like pull back a bit. Um, but what we've done is like you take your NFT and you turn it into a basket that enables it to hold other assets. So then this NFT or non-fungible token is suddenly a container that can hold other assets. This can be other ERC-20 tokens. They can earn interest. They can be speculative tokens. They can be LP tokens. They can be other NFTs. And you, um, you create this new token dynamic of having an NFT with an interest-bearing asset inside of it. So the interest equates to how long you've held that NFT. There's, there's, there's a bunch you can do here. So yes, it's enabled by smart contracts. And then uh, seeing in the chat, somebody saying, how can we find out more about the, the concept of smart contracts? Um, I'd probably, I don't have a good, good resource, but again, like anything Andreas Antonopoulos uh, talks about, he's probably like a good, no hype way of uh, exploring it. And I'll, I'll spell his name because he's uh, Greek and it's hard. That, that would be awesome, I think. But Andreas is, is a great resource, not only for Ethereum, but for all the cryptocurrencies. He's, he's in the showcase on privacy coins. It's, it's just amazing. It's the most comprehensive one that I've seen. And it's he's kind of trying to explain it for in the, in the, in the dummy language. So everybody can, can understand it. Yeah, so, he's... Uh, I, very, very good. Yep. So you mentioned something about the Web3 and how how is that important for Ethereum? Can you double click on that or you're not that technical in terms of speaking about the Web3? Yeah, so um, broadly speaking, um, Web3 is like this new, more privacy, excuse me, privacy, focused version of the web that we think we're going to. So controlling your own data, um, less privacy intrusive, more decentralized version of the web. So this is um, kind of a concept that like we're moving towards, right? Um, so something like Ethereum enables a lot of the uh, plumbing required to get there. Um, so yeah, web three is a fascinating topic. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So how can people get exposed to Ethereum? It's uh, smart contracts, everything that is being hosted on top of that platform itself. What is What are some of the ways that people can get some exposure to it? Yeah. Marty just dropped a link to ethereum.org slash developers. This is probably a really good resource um, in terms of like, I mean, Again, if you're interested in building on Web3 in, uh, in uh, Ethereum, I'll drop a link for uh, Gitcoin Kernel, which I, I just I have nothing but good things to say about this program. It's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. Great way to meet people within the space. Awesome. And yeah, I mean, uh, it's the web three is pretty much a web three dot js so it's a framework that's sort of similar to node.js but running exclusively on the eat platform oh yeah and the web three accelerator has a bunch of knowledge databases that everybody interested can check out and learn a lot more so yeah, if you won't mind, Ben, just back up a bit. How can people get exposed to Ethereum, the whole platform? What are the ways that you can acquire something like that? We all know about mineable, mineability of that blockchain of that cryptocurrency. What are the use cases? And uh, just expand from that there. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, Ethereum is a blockchain similar to Bitcoin being a blockchain and all the, a, a number of other ones. So 
ETH, ETH is the cryptocurrency that is used for fuel on the blockchain. So uh, both ETH and Bitcoin are proof of work blockchains, which means there's like a mining network of computers uh, that are solving algorithms, solving problems to like secure the proof of work blockchain. So Ethereum is moving to a proof of stake blockchain. Um, this is ETH2, which is coming at some unbeknown time in the future, allegedly soon. But um, the way that one would acquire ETH um, to use for transaction fees on the Ethereum blockchain, I mean, the easiest way is to sign up for something like Coinbase. They're going to IPO or, or be publicly traded at some point this year. Um, $150 billion valuation, super secure. So you have to put in your bank account, do a KYC or whatever. Um, it's probably fine. Um, another way right now, because it's proof of work, is you could spin up a miner, a miner, and uh, be a node and actually earn ETH for helping secure the network. Um, or so you can either buy it or earn it. Uh, these are the ways. Uh, the the other under like the subcategories under earn is, you know, you could start working for a cryptocurrency based project and take your pay in ETH. Um, and then the like subcategories under buy would be you buy it through a centralized exchange, something like um, uh, Coinbase, uh, or or you know you take a bag full of cash and do an OTC trade with somebody at a Starbucks uh, parking lot, which is you know probably not the best way, but also a way. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, local bitcoins used to be big a couple of years ago, and right now it's all down falls just because of ease of use and ease of access to all these different all of these different tools that are allowing us to buy cryptocurrencies with our plastic cards virtual cards no matter what cards we we have so yeah and it's it's pretty cool i mean once you have eth um and you have a web3 wallet you have like a browser wallet or 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 mobile or whatever um then you're kind of like in the ecosystem of whatever cryptocurrency you choose. So I'm, I'm just using ETH for an example, but like, and once you're there and you have a browser wallet, I would recommend MetaMask or Portis, um, then you, it really opens up the doors to all these different applications that are using Ethereum. So you have pr pretty amazing things like um, uh, decentralized exchanges. So Coinbase is a centralized exchange. And then you have decentralized versions of this, which is like, I'm swapping ETH with some other token through these completely decentralized versions of a thing like Coinbase. Um, and, and, and then there's all these different derivatives of that. Hell, there's even derivative platforms. You know, I can buy a virtual or a, a synthetic call or put option. So uh, the, the amount of innovation that's happening, uh, basically taking everything that exists like in a more centralized manner and saying, let's decentralize it, build it on, on top of Ethereum, make it unstoppable, uncensorable. All of these benefits uh, is, is pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. It's, it really is amazing. Mm, recently, I mean, everybody noticed uh, something popping up and that name constantly came back and, is just reoccurring it day after day. It's hosted on the Ethereum network and it's something called an NFT. So why all of a sudden NFTs, how people can develop those, what are, how can people enter into the NFT field of NFT realm of things? And um, why are they all of a sudden that popular in your opinion? Yeah, sure. So an NFT, so we have Ethereum, we've talked about Ethereum. We have ETH, which is ETH, uh, which is the fuel, the, currency. The, the base currency of the Ethereum blockchain. So then Ethereum allows you to create additional tokens that like live on top of the Ethereum blockchain. So uh, the standard for a standard token is an ERC-20. So this is... Um, many of the tokens that exist out there, but there's other token standards that exist. So uh, NFT, when people say that, uh, are probably referring to ERC-721 or 1155. So this is just a different token standard. And what an NFT is, um, 
it's probably best to say, what is, but does anybody know what fungible means? So fungibility just means that the things are the same. So uh, $1 equals $1. Uh, they're interchangeable. I, I don't care if I have this one or this one. They're both basically the same. So it, uh, there's a bit of a semantics issue because a non-fungible token just means that $1 doesn't equal $1 because this one has been signed by Michael Jordan. So it's got more value. It's not equal to this one anymore. This one, I would much rather have this dollar. So that is non-fungibility. So this, this broad category that is non-fungible tokens just means that these tokens are unique. This token does not equal this token. So what does that mean? I, I have a unique token. Well, if I have a medical record that I put on the blockchain as a token, that's an NFT. If I buy a virtual plot of land in a decentralized world, that plot of land is very specific and does not equal that one. So that is also an NFT. Well, you have this, this, this big push with creators right now, and you tie a piece of art, whether, or whether it be an actual painting or a, like digital painting, um, a, 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 a song track, a video, you tie that to a, a ERC-721 and make that unique item as a token, that can also be a use case for an NFT. So an NFT is just this, I mean, it's a semantics issue, right? It's literally a token that is non-fungible, so it's unique. But um, this explosion of interest is just... Um, yeah, it's fascinating. For the first time in, in, in the world, we've solved this problem for, of digital scarcity for art. Like it's been here for a while, right? But like suddenly people have woken up to the idea. So uh, why this might have value is um, if, I, if I'm a fam famous photographer, I take a picture, um, I, I blow it up, I, I sell a few of the prints, you know, um, if I sell this print to you, Marco, you own this print. It's undeniable. You have it in your house now. Um, if you say, hey, I want to buy a digital uh, version of that, like a digital uh, print or a digital version, um, I send you the JPEG. You Venmo me 20 bucks. So you own that JPEG. Uh, and then you forward it to VJ and you say, hey, hey check this out. Ben took out this picture. Uh, yeah, you can have it. And VJ's like, oh, that's awesome. And he mails it out to the whole Hack Buddy uh, email list. So now Marco paid me for this digital print. Then he sent it to VJ. Then VJ sent it to everybody else. So everybody has this print. So who owns this print? Because Marco's like, oh, I own it. I paid for it. And you're like, no, everybody owns the same thing, right? So it's, it's been impossible to say like who owns that digital good because it's infinitely replicable uh, because it doesn't have a home anywhere. It's just this, this JPEG. So crypto, the blockchain, this ERC-721 standard of digital unique tokens has given that digital print a home on the blockchain. So it, it, Marco transfers me 20 bucks, I transfer him the token. He owns that token. It's undeniable. It's provable on the blockchain. There's a blockchain-based ownership saying Marco owns that token. Yep. Uh, there's a question from uh, Q asking you if we can talk about how artists get a cut of every transaction. Yeah, so um, like digitization is a big deal. Right, so now Marco owns this piece of art, this NFT. Um, he can now list it for sale in 20 different marketplaces at the same time. That's very different than your art piece sitting up on your wall, right? Like you can take a picture and post it places maybe, but like somebody still has to physically come to your house to buy that thing. So he can post this thing everywhere. He can, assuming that that you find a lender, he can assign a value to it and pull out a line of credit on it. Like he can put it in a smart contract, fractionalize it and sell pieces of it to a bunch of investors that want to own a fractional ownership of that piece of art. So the the benefits of like digitization are, are very, very great in this case. Um, most of these are facilitated by smart contracts. 
also facilitated by smart contracts are the idea of artist royalties. So written into the smart contract when I create this ERC-721 is that every time it transfers and the price goes up, a portion of that goes back to me, the creator's wallet, every single time into perpetuity. Uh, so this, this allows for this uh, perpetual artist royalty um, as time goes on. Um, and, and, and all of this is customizable contracts, right? So if I want 50% of the price increase to go back to me, the, the artist, like I can. If I want just a percentage of the total price to go back to me, I can. Uh, something that we have with charged particles is like, you can have an interest bearing asset inside that piece of art that Marco now has. Well, a portion of that interest generated can always goes back, back to me, the artist, into perpetuity. Uh, as like some sort of artist royalty in, in addition to the increase in price. So smart contracts allow this uh, and they're completely customizable, I guess is the short answer. Um, that's not a short, that's really a comprehensive answer in my opinion. The reason that I kind of ask you to go down the NFT world is because you, you, I know for a fact that you participated in the NFT hackathon that happened last weekend, if, if I remember correctly. And I went over the program and a bunch of protocols like the Rarible and the Zora platforms are something that should be fairly similar, uh, similar to somebody that's also proficient in React.js, has set up their own node platform, uh, had explored into React Native. So can you, if you won't mind just sharing some some of the highlights that you saw during the hackathon. Yeah, sure. So um, this was sponsored by ETH Global, which do these gigantic hackathons a few times a year, and it was called NFT Hack. So uh, one of the headline sponsors was Zora. Uh, we Charge Particles were one of the other sponsors as well, but like they had judges, uh, like Gary V was a judge. I mean, uh, big time. So it was, it was really, really sweet. Um, I was a bit in the trenches. So since we were a sponsor, we had a number of projects building on our protocol. Uh, so we were basically doing customer support and well, just more support uh, because we want people to build pretty freaking cool stuff with our protocol. So I was kind of more in the in our own chat, kind of fielding questions and helping other developers. But um, I still am, it's on my list to go through a lot of them. But the um, I love hackathons overall. Actually, this is how I met uh, Marco through Charity Makeover, which was hackathons for charities. Um, but um, yeah, so the, 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 uh, creativity that kind of is an output from these hackathons is is really cool um and you know each of these teams use the sponsors tech in uh innovative new ways i mean the way i view it for charged particles is like this is a uh, this is a sandbox. This is a, a, a playground um, that regulations we don't really worry about. We're just building things in the name of innovation, right? So like go crazy, do something wild, like use this bits and pieces of the code in a way that we haven't thought of and, and spin up something amazing in the name of innovation. So um, yeah, I can share, I can share a Twitter thread where they like, uh, said the the prize products, but there was there was a lot of really cool innovation uh, that was happening, and this was the first kind of hackathon that they've done for a while or ever that they um, allowed like creators to join as well. Like so, normally it's just dev, just devs, um, and uh, this time there were like there were some artists and some content creators, and uh, so yeah, it was it was it was really cool. So actually, they've they've got their next hackathon on April sixteenth, which is scaling Ethereum. So um, we talked about Ethereum moving to this ETH two, uh, which is like a, a more scalable version of this infrastructure that is Ethereum. So they've got a hackathon coming up for that, which would be really cool. There's a bunch of really awesome technologies um, that are being used there. Yeah, also, uh, Q, I'm going to share a link for everybody from a talk 
given by Latasha during that hackathon. I love the recording of it. Uh, they, there's a whole panel on this and they talk about how Ethereum is actually going to become a platform that is really suitable for artists instead of like developers only and people that are uh, familiar with the, the technology and with development on that platforms. Just because there are so many spin-off companies popping up here and there that they are just able to produce services, provide services for smart contracts so you can lock your every type of artwork, every type of project, whatever you're doing into the Ethereum blockchain and just capitalize on having it stored proof of having the blockchain to be your proof for whatever you're doing. Let me just shoot, shoot this link here. It's the, again, the, the title of the talk is called Ethereum is for artists. And um, so, yeah, now Ben, what do you think we should cover next while we're still at the Ethereum discussion, while we're still conversing about the Ethereum blockchain? Uh, so, I mean, Ethereum is a is a smart contract platform. It's this world supercomputer. Um, a theme that kind of happens within the crypto community um, in these kind of bull runs and things is there's always a ETH killer or next Ethereum. Um, these happen. These are big uh, marketing pushes by other companies, but um, mm -hmm. I would just encourage you to kind of look at the developer activity um, which, which can be gamed, I guess I know. Um, uh, but like ETH seems to have the most vibrant active developer use case and, 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 and um, apps on top of it, et cetera. But there are some other ones. So Polkadot is also very similar. Um, actually, if you're interested in hearing the history of Ethereum, it's, um, it's quite good. Uh, Camila Russo wrote a book called The Infinite Machine, which uh, reads like a freaking movie and it's real life. Um, but it, it, it's quite interesting to hear about like the genesis, of the, the beginning of Ethereum and some of these other characters, uh, not char characters is probably the wrong term, but, but some of these people that were involved at that time um, have launched their own like ETH alternatives. So um, something like Polkadot or Cardano, these guys were part of the Ethereum group early days and they see they see issues with the way that Ethereum is going or, or see a way to make it a little bit better. So, you know, they, they've launched their own chain. Um, so it, 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 it helps provide some context of perhaps like uh, where they saw differently and kind of why they chose to go those paths. But I mean, there's, there's other platforms that are trying to do what ETH is doing. Um, because it's a big bounty, right? I, I don't know the the market cap of Ethereum, but it's maybe thirty billion dollars. I don't know. No, way bigger than that these days. I don't know, three hundred billion. Anyway, should, should be check. Should be up. Yeah. Uh, so so I mean, it's a it's a rather big bounty for people to um, go there and and take that. It's a billion. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a lot. So 180 we, billion. Yeah, since yeah. we've thrown out a number, like how do you explain the value of Ethereum since we're talking about it to, to people? How do you explain the value? Like like the so 180 billion is this big or small, I guess is the question, right? Yep. Um yeah, I have no clue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, so if you believe that Ethereum will be the world supercomputer and a lot of these things will be built on top of Ethereum, 180 billion is seems very, very small. Um, if you believe that it's Tulip Mania 2.0 uh, or 3.0 or 5.0 or whatever version we are at this point, uh, then yeah, perhaps it's over overvalued by crazy orders of magnitude. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure. There's there's a lot of use cases for Ethereum. Uh, mm -hmm. DeFi, decentralized finance, is like uh, pretty hot right now. Um, it's really cool. That's what I was talking about earlier with MakerDAO. So taking out a loan, using your crypto as collateral. I think that there's a lot of 
of fluff and kind of like overhype within the DeFi community. It's basically just a levered nonsense right now. You just kind of borrow from here and lend here and then take that as collateral and put it here. And then before you know it, you've kind of lost sight of the shore, but you're earning yield and whatever. So, it, um, but, but whenever this like comes back down to earth, um, there's a lot of awesome innovation uh, that has been happening that, you know, these will serve as the core foundational building blocks to take it to the next level. And it's the same thing with crypto art, right? Like there's um, everybody and their brother is creating an NFT and wanting to get into the space. So it's a bit of a, a, a mania, but, you know, does it go 20x from here before it comes back down? Who knows? Uh, does it go down, down by 95% tomorrow? Possibly. Um, is it somewhere in between? Probably. See, I see an interesting question from Jamil. Thank you, Jamil. This is a really nice one. What are some beginner friendly crypto technologies that I can tinker with at my next hackathon that will impress crypto judges? Beginner friendly crypto technologies I can tinker with. Um, so, to impress crypto judges, I'll tackle that one first. I think it really depends on the hackathon because uh, every hackathon kind of has a theme, right? So this next ETH Global one is all about scaling solutions. So um, it doesn't really matter what you tinker with if it's not in the theme of like scaling solutions, it's, it, it's, it's probably not gonna impress them too much. So I tackled the low ball and, and then beginner friendly crypto technologies. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean here. Like most of the, the cool thing about crypto is most of this is open source. Um, so you can, you can build on the backs of what other people have built. So it depends on your tech stack, but uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of libraries and things that exist and all of this open source uh, uh, code. So you can kind of like hodgepodge these things together in a, a, a neat, innovative way. But um, I mean, as with everything, there's there's probably, it's very hard to have like a truly innovative new idea, right? So finding out who has built something else and kind of leveraging what they've built uh, to start off. Uh, in my personal opinion, something that will impress judges if the hackathon is to develop and launch right, cryptocurrencies, like a standalone cryptocurrency is will, should, should be something to like, create your coin in two hours three hours in a single day and I, I i know it it can be done i've done it not in three hours but in a, in like a few days where you pretty much find a nice coin nice algorithm you fork their uh, github repository into your own find a server to host your master nodes on it so pretty much you can fork any crypto night coin with a day work day worth of work if you happen to find a server to host your master nodes and if you happen to find somebody to mine it like to put their computers and their uh, hardware technologies towards your currency towards your blockchain to contribute to your blockchain and actually sustain it then it means that you can launch your own coin in a matter of like days worth of work a great resource for finding miners, people that would pretty much mine any coin is just make an announcement on Bitcoin talk. And a lot of people should be hitting you up, messaging you, following up, trying to set up a mining pool. I don't know if anybody's familiar about the mining principles. We can go that down that rabbit hole if you're, you're interested, but yeah, I mean, it's something that's been around for a while, while the NFT community is something that's really uh, kicking up, really coming strong recently. So that's why I'm kind of being so persistent and insisting on getting answers on NFTs. So I want to double click on something you mentioned, taking loan out of MakerDAO. 
what would what what are your thoughts hypothetically if somebody comes in and regulates crypto what would happen to that loan that you've taken very good question <laughs> um yeah so this is this is part of the there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty in most areas of crypto. So take NFTs, for example. I mean, these things are super hot and everybody's talking about them. Well, nobody has any idea what to do about trademarks and copyrights within NFTs. Like, it's just kind of a big question mark. So <laughs> the same thing goes with these more financial products. Like, I mean, I can literally use crypto as collateral pull out of loan, but it's issued by some foundation or some decentralized autonomous organization, DAO. So the whole area is gray for sure. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's bad or that it's illegal. It just means that there's never been really an easy way that I'm aware of to digitally uh, take a digital asset that it has that is accepted that it has a value and use that in a trustless way to take out a, a loan in another digital asset that is accepted to have value without touching any uh, central authority, any party in between. So it's it's gray because it's freaking crazy cool. Like I mean, I don't know. Uh, so in terms of like, if regulator, regulators come in and regulate it, I mean, a lot of these companies by design are like, it's governed by a DAO that is owned by token holders, that is widely distributed, that is uh, uh, voted on in a an unstoppable program where you use your your tokens to vote based on the next steps of the protocol. So like, who's making, who's calling the shots for this thing? It's not an entity. It's, there's no CEO. There's no like executive team. There's governance token holders who it, it, it's completely democratized. Anybody can buy them on these decentralized exchange. Anybody can use those to vote on the decision-making of the protocol. So who freaking knows, right? Uh, I mean, for us with charged particles is like, um, the impending disaster, um, well, not just us, but any any NFT marketplace is like, what if somebody comes to your platform and they mint a bunch of terrible photos? Like I'm talking terrible, terrible photos that I don't wanna mention on here. Like it is unstoppable, immutable. It's written to the blockchain. Yes, we have, um, you know, the images of maybe hosted on IPFS, which is like the decentralized storage, but like, we can't really sever as soon as they create that token. Um, you can do certain things where you block the API and it won't show on our um, website or something like that. But like, it's unstoppable, which is kind of, kind of part of it, right? Um, so yeah, it 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 is regulatory gray because it is new and innovative, and it will continue to be regulatory gray um, for quite some time. Strongly agree with that that theory. And definitely you you can get in trouble. You can get in trouble and whole the whole space can get in trouble if it starts going down the dark ways, like if it starts going to the dark web type of areas. But I've just I just know that there are a lot of people that are just interested into putting quality content onto the blockchain. So eventually good will or way and be victorious over the bad. I hope so. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, the worry is that somebody starts putting very malicious, terrible things up on the blockchain and it gets a lot of press and then uh, the regulators step in because uh, there's a bunch of nonsense happening, uh, which which probably will happen. Probably, that, that that's the word, probably. Okay, so we have a question. What will happen? What will be the role of miners after ETH 2.0? So let's just walk into this by explaining the core differences between Ethereum and ETH 2.0. What is known at this moment? What will be the key difference between those two blockchains? And whether the biggest 
kind of concern at the moment whether ETH 2.0 will be built on top of the current Ethereum? Yeah, uh, good question, Marty. So um, what we were talking about with ETH and Bitcoin, that they're proof of work uh, blockchain. So you have miners that are securing the code um, and securing the network. And this is how the blockchain and proof of work blockchains work. So Ethereum 2.0 is moving towards proof of stake. So instead of this network of miners that are mining blocks to secure the network, you actually have stakers, people uh, who own large quantities of ETH who stake it and they say, I'm validating these transactions and I'm putting this money at stake as opposed to, I'm not proving that I, I, I care about this by expending energy, energy um, via mining, I'm proving it via my pile of cash, right? So um, miners in the terms of like these uh, machines that are running algorithms to secure the network don't serve a purpose at that point. Um, that the stakers with their piles of cash then will be the ones that are securing the network. So this is this is like a slow transition. I don't know what the timeline is. Um, and ETH 2.0 is one of those things that I've always just kind of thought or worried that it was a, a, a bit more of a mirage than a real thing, but it's, it's starting to look like it's gonna become more of a reality. I'm bullish on ETH uh, either way, but... Um, uh, yeah, so it's something I definitely need to read up on in, in more detail, that's for sure. Uh, so ETH 2.0 will be a non-minable coin. It will be pretty much operating as a token with a key difference where you, you will be actually verifying transactions on the ETH blockchain by having your wallet open to the network and being witness, taking, being reported for that you'll be witnessing other transactions happening on the blockchain. Yeah, but so worth worth me... mentioning that like, I think there's gonna be some, I, I'll be interested to see what happens, right? You think of who are these miners? They're, they're individuals, they're pools, they're groups of individuals that have spent a lot of money to acquire the machinery necessary to mine Ethereum as a proof of work system, proof of work blockchain. So if you switch and you just say, basically say, hey, miners, uh, you know, take all that ETH that you've earned, hopefully you've kept it and you haven't, you know, sold it to pay your electricity bills, take all of that and stake it instead. And that, that those stakers are validators and they'll replace you. Well, what happens to all that mining capacity? So they can switch over to another chain that, um, you know, uses the same algorithm or uh yeah i don't know i i i lean towards they're not going to give up without a fight because they've kind of put up a lot of uh investment into this so i don't know what that looks like um i don't really want to speculate on what that looks like but i would not be so surprised if um they don't just quietly go okay yeah we'll just retire this or or, or switch to another chain uh, we had Andy Young from the Litecoin community a few months ago, and a key point that he made was a lot of the old Bitcoin miners, like the Ant Miner S3, S9 series that are a couple of years old now, are actually still being used to mine a different coin on a different blockchain just because they're operating in the same algorithm. So a lot of the old technology used to mine Bitcoin, those old ASIC miners are currently mining the Doge, Dogecoin or some other coin that is running on the same SHA256 algorithm. And it's, it's nice to know that like the, that technology is being recycled. It's been put to use. Yeah. So another thing that I wanted to ask you is, have you had a chance to explore Decentraland recently? And would you mind yeah. explaining like what that is more in depth? Yeah, sure. So um, I recently just had a guy join my team who like was into crypto in 2017 and 18, and then he just kind of disappeared. And now he's, he, he's back into the crypto world. And I told him that basically all the like the weirdness that started in 2017, it just got like a hundred X more weird. So uh, in a good way, right? So um, 
the uh, Decentraland is a metaverse, which a metaverse is like the movie Ready Player One. So it's this virtual world where we can exist and do things and own things and interact with other people. Uh, so the idea of this metaverse being owned by somebody like Facebook is is pretty terrifying. So like the idea of having a more decentralized version of this metaverse that is unstoppable, that if I own a plot of land, the company in, in this example would be Facebook, you know, can't just suddenly change ownership or keep track of this, that it's all like this decentralized utopia. So Decentraland is one of these virtual worlds uh, that is attempting to be like the virtual world or the metaverse. Uh, but there's other alternatives as well. So crypto voxels is also a very cool one. It's like pixel or voxel based. Um, and then there's uh, like sandbox and a bunch of other somnium space that, uh, you know, I haven't explored further, but um, we at charge particles, we do every three weeks, we do a metaverse party. Uh, so we can't throw parties in real life. Um, so we do these virtual world parties where we have, I mean, you have these little like, uh, avatars walking around these virtual worlds and we have a stage and uh, dance parties and uh, music and a virtual art gallery where you can walk around and actually buy nfts as virtual art um it's pretty cool so long story long decentraland is a metaverse a decentralized uh world virtual world awesome and Travin, thanks you for correcting me. Uh, yes, Litecoin and Dogecoin are script running on the script algorithm. They're not in the SHA-256, not the same as Bitcoin. So how can we pretty much use the NFTs in the central Decentraland? What are your thoughts, Ben? Yeah, so... Um... One, like, so we talked in the very beginning about what are NFTs and it's just a not fungible token. It's a token that's not fungible, uh, which sounds silly because that's what it is. It's a non-fungible token, but that's actually the definition. It's a, it's a token that's not fungible. So um, it's a unique token, right? So this, uh, a very easy example would be I own a plot of land in one of these virtual lands. That's represented as a non-fungible token. I build a building there. That's a non-fungible token. I hang a piece of art in my virtual land or in my virtual building on my virtual land. That also can be a non-fungible token. I have an avatar that runs around these worlds. I buy a hat and I buy pants and I buy shoes. These can be non-fungible tokens as well. Um, so there's a lot of kind of nfts that exist within these virtual worlds and they're kind of the perfect um the perfect place for these to exist and have value does this make sense from an investor's perspective like from your perspective to be poking around like setting up smart contracts for something that i'll just have it hosted on the central end yeah i mean well, you know, I, I, I had I did a bunch of podcasts on NFTs like last summer in June, July, uh, because it it like it's fascinating to me. And, and, and this categorization within NFTs, there's so many different ones. Um, so like from an investor standpoint, it's extremely fascinating because it's this new asset class. You have real estate, like the the physical place I see next to me, and then you have virtual real estate, which exists in this virtual metaverse. Um, so, yeah, I think broadly speaking, um, uh, NFTs as a category are very, very interesting. But it's just like anything else; you can't just jump in and buy a bunch of NFTs and like expect to be successful, right? Like crypto art requires a whole new skill set of NFT investing. You have to understand art, you have to understand demand and the artists and, and all of these things. And the same with something like virtual real estate. You can't just buy a plot of land. Well, maybe you can't, but like um, you have to understand the, the layout of the city and where people are building and what people are buying there and why and what are they gonna do with it. So uh, very similar uh, aspects to like normal uh, 
real estate investing. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Good point. Like this is not invest uh, investment advice. We just need to add a disclaimer there. That not just telling you to put your money into something, but uh, again, it's your personal opinion. And if you want to learn a lot more about crypto, Ben does run. I mentioned this in the beginning of our conversation. Ben is the co-host of Crypto Mondays a meetup group in LA. They're meeting up every Monday and Thursday, right? Uh, we've we've ditched the Thursday thing, but yes, I, every it, it was also confusing. It's called Crypto Mondays, so to meet on Thursday, it just kind of it was it was a terrible idea. And I, signing up for two times a week in person was uh, kind of a disaster. So I'm dropping a link, but it's Crypto Mondays LA. Uh, this is a global movement. There's uh, Crypto Mondays uh, likely in uh, in a city near you, um, but it's at 6 p.m. in uh, Venice. And it's most easily found on meetup.com. But I dropped a link in there. You're only invited if you want to chat a bit more with Ben about the investment markets. How are they playing out? What, what is currently rising? What are some hot prospects? Uh, if I should name them like that in the crypto field, what is Ben currently looking at in the crypto field? So would you mind just uh, like, giving us some uh, insights on what are you currently tra tracking in the crypto field, crypto realm? Yeah, sure. Uh, and thanks, Traven, for the shout out. So Tra Traven, I know from Prague, um, my days in Europe, but uh, we, we threw quite a few meetups there, uh, which always seemed to be a good time. But, but beer is cheaper than water there. So, you know, it's, it, it's less hard to make like a, a really fun event, I suppose. Um, in terms of like what I'm looking at in the crypto market, so I, uh, I am running uh, Charge Particles, which is uh, an insane time commitment. I mean, I, I've had 50 Zoom calls this week. I think this is number 50, which is just bonkers. So we can't get anything done, but it is what it is. Um, but broadly speaking, I mean, I'm very interested in the concepts of decentralization and these uh, in cryptocurrencies. So big fan of Bitcoin and Ethereum. These are kind of the biggest two. Um, I think Polkadot is pretty interesting as well. Um, I'm, I, I'm an advisor for a Polkadot Oracle that's called Kylan um, that I've been working on for quite some time as well. But like um, the, the biggest ones are my own project, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, and Polkadot at this time. Mind. And then I guess DeFi, NFTs as like massive categories, but um, you know, not really comfortable with saying saying individual projects or 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 uh, things within those. Yeah. Hashtag not financial advice. <laughs> That's cool. Oh, and please. and just the meetups that are in Venice, like, um, it would welcome you guys to join. We have a broad uh, group of crypto traders, people from traditional finance, um, miners, developers, marketers. Now with NFTs growing in popularity, we get some artists that are interested in learning more. And I, I, I see uh, NFTs almost as like a Trojan horse to get artists, <laughs> to get more artists into crypto, right? Because everybody starts off of like, I don't want to deal with this Web3 bull crap and then like uh three months later they're either like hardcore ethereum and like web3 decentralization or they've left so uh you know it is what it is but um if you're around and you're okay meeting in person uh people do wear masks we do meet outside uh we are respectful of those things um pop on by uh, check out meetup.com we're always around um then when people are talking about getting involved in cryptocurrency, they mostly consider like investing, spending your money. What will be like a general advice on investing in cryptocurrencies? What are that would be Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, or any alternative coin that's being published, produced, mined, state, whatever? Yeah. So, um, giving any sort of investment advice is very difficult, right? Um, so 
do your own research, don't invest money you can't afford to lose, like uh, talk to your financial advisor, all of the, the, the um, disclaimers I'm supposed to say. But um, I mean, really, the decision to invest in something like cryptocurrency needs to be looked at like more holistically. So if you're in debt up to your eyeballs, like probably shouldn't put any money into crypto, you should be paying down that debt. Um, but like, assuming you've, uh, you know, stepped over all of the like personal finance investing principles and you have spare cash to invest in something like crypto, the easiest way is to sign up for a, a, a centralized exchange, something like Coinbase, um, take whatever amount that you want to buy. Uh, so say it's a hundred dollars, um, divide it by six and over the next six months or six weeks, whatever, um, just put that amount into uh, Bitcoin and, and or Ethereum. Um, and then once you kind of have a little bit of money in it, you start paying attention to it a little bit more, listen to some of the resources we've dropped in here earlier, learning more about it. And um, yeah, they call it the, the or used to call it the mind virus, right? Like as soon as you start learning about Bitcoin, you start questioning money, you start reading books about the Federal Reserve, you start... The, being a bit of a gold bug, then you realize that that's like outdated and you, you know, you, you follow your own path, but um, it's a, it's an interesting path and it's an awesome community. That's cool. That's, that's really cool. So since we're not giving like any financial advice, um, do you know of any other ways for people to get like more info on getting their JavaScript skills up so they can work on web, uh, web three.js or any resources that are, should be valuable. I know that you were looking for a front end developer or a full stack developer. Recently I shared the job listing among our, on our platforms, on our discord and Slack. Don't know what happened. I didn't really follow through there, but yeah, I'm just looking if you do have some any any resources, guys, to give people to get involved, not as investors but as developers. Yeah. So as developers, I mean, I'm a big fan of show don't tell. Um, so joining in these um, uh, hackathons is a great way to get involved. You you are paired up with somebody else. So. Um, as a developer, so talking to you guys, um, you are a scarce resource. Like money is abundant and innovation is scarce right now. So you join up with some other developers, probably uh, uh, augmenting your abilities. So if, if whatever part of the stack that you focus on, you find the other people and then in these hackathons, you can create something wow. magical and something amazing. And if nothing else, it serves as a great networking. Um, but who knows, maybe you'll create something that might have potential and have some legs and turn into something else. But um, yeah, the biggest one would be uh, hackathons. There's also something called Gitcoin, which is really cool. Um, so you can do these things called bounties, which would be like um, me as a company owner, I can put up a bounty for something I want done and the open source community can, um, can work on it. So um, Gitcoin is super cool. Uh, this is, uh, they actually don't have a coin. So um, they're the ones uh, behind, oh my God, sorry about the uh, URL, but just gitcoin.co um, would be, would work. Um, they have a Gitcoin grants program uh, that happens like every three months. It's going on right now. If you do feel a bit altruistic and want to give back to the community, it's a really cool match matching function. So for every dollar that you donate to uh, these projects and developers and entities that are putting up their grants there, it's matched by this matching pool of bigger entities. So like $1 donation might equal $50 for that team. So literally every dollar counts. It's a, it's called quadratic voting and it's a freaking really cool way to kind of give back to the community um, in a, in a really innovative way, but the ways to get involved, join hackathons, um, join Gitcoin, uh, the uh, bounties or, and, and, and check out the uh, grants for sure. These would be the biggest, biggest ones that I can offer. 
And then I want to be cognizant of your time and just ask you something that I enjoy asking people that are really knowledgeable about cryptocurrencies are the, the question is, what are the use cases that you see of cryptocurrencies personally? Um, yeah, so f for us, well, for me as an American, I've never had like an issue of getting a bank account or anything like that. Um, so, I mean, this has probably been overused at this point, but like, I mean, literally gold was outlawed in the U.S., for a big period of time, 40 years or whatever. So like illegal to own gold, right? Um, so you think of a place, so so when people are like, oh, that would never happen in the US, it's like, yeah, well, yeah, just not, you know, recency bias, not lately. Um, but you think of somebody in uh, like Venezuela or some, some country where the government is less trustworthy. You don't want to have money in a bank account. Uh, maybe there's hyperinflation. It gives you this option to like opt out and have your money kind of outside of the system. But more importantly is I, I can memorize 12 words in my head and you can strip me down completely. You know, uh, search me, beat my family, tell me to, uh, uh, to give you these words. And I you know, assuming that I don't give them to you, I can walk across the border butt naked and, um, you know, find clothes, hope, hopefully on the other side. And at some point, connect to the internet, assuming that the internet still works. If not, you know, what other store of value would have value anyways? Um, and and access this money, this Bitcoin or, or whatever cryptocurrency that I've just, just by memory, memorizing these 12 words. So I think that... That is such a powerful notion um, that it's just just unbelievable. Um, so that is an amazing, amazing use case of just uh, crypto in general. But um, yeah, I get really excited about what's possible with these smart contracts. I mean, what's happening in DeFi? Um, there's a lot. Yeah, it's it's easy to get excited in bull markets, I suppose. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's true. That's true. So. I just want to be really cognizant of your time, really understand you that you had 50 plus meetings this week and we're like towards the end of Wednesday only. And I just want to ask anybody if they have any questions that they wanna, that wanted to ask but failed to submit to Ben so he can tackle those while we have him online. If not, feel free to connect with him, his at Ben Lakov on Twitter. And he's really active on social media when he's not on, on meetings. Like really, really active, but yeah, I'll just wait for it. Not that minutes. active, man, come on. <laughs> <laughs> not really, really active. I try to be active. What else, Michelle? Awesome. 